Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the new screensavers is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. The new screensavers is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash NSS. And by Eero. Never think about Wi-Fi again with Eero's hyper-fast, super-simple Wi-Fi system. And now, the second-generation Eero is tri-band and twice as fast. For free overnight shipping to the U.S. or Canada, visit Eero.com, select overnight shipping at checkout, and enter the code NSS. And by WordPress. Plans start at just $4 a month. Plus, get 15% off your brand new website today at wordpress.com slash NSS. The next gen of nuclear power, we get Google Home maxed and look up in the sky, it's the Aurora Borealis. Live from the Twit Eastside Studios in beautiful Petaluma, it is the new screensavers. <laughs> Yorkshire, England, did our show open, and he brought me the most valuable thing they make in Yorkshire. Some Yorkshire gold tea. Oh. Now we're talking real Yorkshire tea. Oh, love it. Thank you, James. <laughs> Welcome. This is the new Screensavers episode 135. Uh, it is our, uh, I think, our last live show of the year, December 16th. 2017. I'm Leo Laporte. I am Megan Maroney. What? I remember you from the old screensavers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you were there. And, and you, you were and there. you were there. And <laughs> Tin Woodsman was there. And I think I got hit on the head at one point. That's all that I can remember. That was me hitting you on the yeah, head. Yeah, probably. <laughs> we have an amazing show. Coming up on today's show, you kick it off because this is going to be your interview. Uh, Dr. Leslie Dewan is here. She's going to tell us how she's shaken up nuclear power. Wow. A small plants all over the country. You know we love photography on this show. We're going to talk about that too. DP Review is here with two segments. We'll kick things off with Dale Baskin, who's going to show us his pictures of the northern lights. It's tricky. And he'll show us his tips for taking pictures if you should be lucky enough to see the Aurora Borealis. And we have one more gift guide, the last wow. gift guide from DP Reviews, the best cameras of the year. <gasps> That's going to be great. The new Star Wars movie is out. Have you seen it? Not yet. <laughs> No spoilers, I promise, but Good. Jason Howell will show us a new smartphone-powered augmented reality experience called Star Wars Jedi Challenges. It uses the new Lenovo VR headset. It's pretty amazing. He was trying it out in our office. Did he hit you with his lightsaber? He did lightsaber? not, but uh, he looked pretty ridiculous, which I think is a good <laughs> sign for VR in the office space. Remember that was a big internet meme, the guy, the kid, the lightsaber kid? Now we all look like that. Yep. Everybody looks dopey. And you have dopey. goggles, so you can't see other people laughing at you. Right. It's amazing. <laughs> it's great. What a great idea. <laughs> Questions, too, from uh, our call for help in the mailbag. But first, let's start with the big news stories. And it's a sad week uh, for us, anyway, because, of course, on Friday, the FCC voted three to two along party lines to eliminate the Obama-era net neutrality regulations. Larry Lessig uh, tweeted, he said, it, it is uh, not just the 2015 regulations, the Internet started free and open, was protected for many years by the FCC uh, and this most recent regulation, and, uh, and now we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, it's not over, though. Uh, this, the Congress, of course, can weigh in on this. The FCC can do whatever, the, it can only do whatever Congress tells it to do, and Congress could weigh in if Chuck Schumer of New York says he's going to uh, announce a bill in the Senate overturning that net neutrality repeal. Well, there's also the Congressional Review Act that could help us out here, but then that has to be signed off by Donald Trump. Right. But he's and done crazier of course, things. The courts, and, and in fact, I saw at least a dozen states that say they're going to sue. Yeah. Some states will also create their own regulations. Then that's going to be tricky because the FCC has said it's not, it's not, there's a federal, our federal uh, uh, oversight trumps, if you 
pardon the expression, <laughs> the state oversight. So we'll see. This is going to be a battle. I don't think it's over. It's going to continue no, on. I don't think so. Make either. sure you contact your uh, Congress critter and let them know what you think. We think it's really important because, frankly, we come to you over the Internet. And if it weren't for a free and open Internet, we, as a small Internet-driven business, could not compete. And so we need a free and open Internet for Twit to survive, for the new screensavers to survive. And, and anyone, Ajit Pai included, who's saying, like, look, you woke up the next morning and everything was fine. Like, first of all, it's going to take 30 days for anything to happen. <laughs> it's and still, then, by the way, it's, it's not done. I mean, it's still, in, in the regulation's still in effect. Yeah. But it's. Did he I, really say that? Was that when he was wearing the Star yeah, Wars outfit? Yeah, he did a whole video of lightsaber. like, look, you can still Instagram your food and you can still oh, do Lord. the Harlem Shake. And by the way, the creator of the Harlem Shake, I think, it's not happy is about uh, that. bringing a copyright uh, <laughs> Good. A case against him because they used the Harlem Shake. No one asked permission to use that music. This is kind of, I gotta say, one thing to repeal net neutrality, another thing to make a video the next day distributed over the internet saying, see, it's all okay. That's crappy. You know what, Agit, get some class. That's just really low class. Sorry, that just irritates no the heck out of me. I haven't, I haven't seen it, but that just irritates the heck Don't out of me. Don't watch it. Uh, here's a strange story. Remember the Mirai botnet late uh, 2016? Uh, it, it, it attacked Internet of Things devices, chiefly uh, routers and cameras, internet cameras. It was right before the election. And I thought, and I think a lot of people thought maybe it was a state actor trying to test weapons to bring the internet down. We thought maybe this is going to be an October surprise. There was a lot of conspiracy theories about it. Turns out it was a college kid from Rutgers and his two college-age pals who were creating a DDoS. It was for DDoS, but it was a scam for people playing Minecraft. So you could, <laughs> you're playing Minecraft to get somebody on the net. And, and target their connection to bring them down so you could, I don't know what, be, I, you beat them in Minecraft? Well, Can you I, beat somebody in Minecraft I, even? I, 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 I looked into this because that was what the headline said, like they wanted to win at Minecraft. I'm like, you don't win at Minecraft, you're just creating pigs Well, and they stuff. were running a server. They were right? running a server. And you can make like $100,000 a month right. by running a Minecraft server. Uh, no Usually with lots of mods, and there are games like Capture the Flag and stuff, so it must have been one of the mods. Right, or yeah, you could charge people, or you could have the better server that people would want to go. So they were creating, they were linking all of these together, right. and then it sort of got out of control. That's the funny and thing. Then once, they didn't intend for it to. No. But then once it did, they were like, well, you know, let's create our own service, our own DDoS service. So they created a service VDOS. Like, as you do, something goes out of control. As one does. Like, it's like you make one mistake. Well, I'm already into it. Don't do that, kids. Like, you could stop. At, you're at, your at its peak, the Mirai botnet was 600,000 infected routers and cameras and was a very powerful tool that actually brought down uh, Dyn, D-Y-N, mm -hmm. uh, uh, internet uh, DNS provider and brought down a big chunk of the internet. Yeah. Anyway, they're caught now. In fact, right. we don't know about this because they the FBI has released the court documents because uh, for a while it was all sealed. Yeah, Wire did a great story. That Check that one out. But yeah, it is so, I mean, yeah, they... Uh, <laughs> it cracks me up. It does. It just shows you how vulnerable we are. Well, we are. I mean, they're smart kids. Like, they're, you know, as most ha hackers, they're very smart. But what they did was they're very simple. They're half smart. All they had to do was scan the Internet for uh, IoT devices, cameras that had the default password. Right. And well, that's part of the problem is these IoT devices are horrifically insecure. So hopefully we're getting better at that. When you were in high school, did you use AOL Instant Messenger? Contact that's very sweet friends? of you, but um, I'm a little bit too old they to did, have You didn't have AIM when you were a kid? No, no. Like when I was a kid in my 20s, yes. <laughs> Actually, it wasn't just AIM that shut uh, down. Uh, AOL shut down the AIM server yesterday, but they also shut down CompuServe. And I did use CompuServe, 735 comma 735 7356 comma in high school right when high i school. was in high school yeah. that's how old comp you serve <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing at it could happen i'm just prematurely aged yeah no we used aim at tech tv we used Did to we? well yeah that's, like there were we didn't a have group, group slack or hip chat or anything yeah like that we'd make snarky wow. comments from our cubicles instead of talking to each other um, look at remember that yeah aol instant messenger I think I know Cursel. Anyway, uh, <laughs> that's gone. They shut it down. The server is no more. So if you were still on AIM, uh, it's time to You're get not. ICQ. You're right? not. I think yeah. you just... Yeah. Yeah. Go out and get ICQ. Disney's buying Fox, $52 billion. 
And by the way, they're not getting all of Fox, mostly just the movie assets. What's great is that finally Star Wars will be reunited uh, because the, uh, Fox owns episode four, the first Star Wars movie. Disney owns all the rest of them. And then also parts of the Marvel Universe are reunited. So the, I've heard really good news. The next Star Wars will have the Hulk captaining the Millennium Falcon. I'm very excited about that. I think that's going to be just the best. I think Hulk and Chewbacca, I see a really interesting relationship there. They, they belong together, mm -hmm. don't you? No. Kidding. Kidding. All right. We got a new product in uh, the house uh, uh, today, or actually a couple of days ago. I think it was on Wednesday. This it came out uh, on uh, earlier this week. I ordered it and got it in a couple of days. This is the Google Home Max. So there's the mini that looks like a donut. There's the midi that looks like um, an air, air freshener. freshener. And then there's the Max. That looks like a pillow. <laughs> Wait, why did it just start? I'm so sorry. No one knows. So there's a there's a okay. button on the top. So it's about the size. In fact, I have a Sonos speaker. Hey, oh, it's shh, don't hi. talk to it. It's about the same size as a Sonos Play 5, but it's about a hundred bucks less. That may not reassure you when you realize that it is still four hundred dollars. Right for the Google Home Max it is not a cheap device. It has all of the Google Assistant built in. We've been doing some comparisons to this in the Sonos, which I, you know we're big Sonos fans. I'm of the opinion it's not as good sounding as the Sonos. To be honest with you, we'd play it for you. We got a microphone, but it seems silly. There is one thing it does though that the Sonos doesn't do. For you has voice, right? Mm -hmm. There's a Sonos One, but that's Amazon Echo and it's limited. This has the full Google Assistant. And watch when you do this. By the way, the Google Home is. Sorry, I'm not sure how to help. Well, it can go like that, right? I mean, it's in, but it can't go like that. By the way, the Google Home is upside down. It will work best if you turn it over. <laughs> but it can go right. It can go that like that, like a traditional speaker. By yes. the way, the Google Home is upside down. Maybe the other way. It will way. work best if you turn it over. It comes with this handy dandy removable soap dish, and you can put that. You can put that right. Uh, so you can have it anywhere. It's it's. Now what? I don't know. I don't, you know. Alexa. No. no. <laughs> Anheuser. Anastasia. <laughs> These things never work. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of interesting. We've actually had it going. We had it going during our holiday special. Uh, and it's kind of interesting to have it, this big booming voice come out of the speaker. I don't know, though. It's a little pricey. Um, I think there are better Bluetooth speakers. You certainly could attach a Google Home Mini to any speaker if you want a better speaker. I'm not sure I would really recommend this. It's uh, two four and a half inch woofers, 2.7 tweeters. Theoretically, the music adjusts to uh, to the room. We haven't really tested that. I don't even know how you would test that. You can stream to it from Chromecast. It does support Bluetooth, but it also has a aux in for a stereo cable. Uh, it will allow you to do pairing. So if you have two of them, just like the Sonos, you can pair it to make a stereo uh, device. It supports, of course, the YouTube music and the Google Play music, but also Spotify and Pandora, TuneIn Internet Radio, iHeartRadio. Uh, you know, it's an interesting product. I, I guess if you're all in on Google, the Google's, you know, home stuff, this would be a nice way to uh, add better music. Should we play some uh, music? Let's sure. try. Um, well, we'll get Listen to Daft Punk, Get Lucky. Get Lucky by Daft Punk, sure. Playing on Google Play Music. It's very friendly. Should I turn it down? Hey, oh, look. Hey! That's what I hate about hey, it. Hey! Turn it down. Turn it down a little bit. It's like a teenager. <laughs> there's a slider. Oh, there's no button names on there. No, it comes with a sticker, which oh. I've removed. Um, so it, it promises a lot. <laughs> it promises a lot of the things that the HomePod, which we do not have yet, promise, right? <laughs> Yeah, it is. It's you like know, room it's a, full filling. It's a crowded space. Uh, the HomePod also will adjust to the room. <sighs> Sonos has a built-in uh, feature on the newer Sonos. They have a little microphone that will tune to the room. Does a, a very good job, I think. 
Um, I, I'm going to stick with Sonos, to be honest. Okay. And if you wanted a voice assistant, you could either have your Google Home Mini connect to a Sonos or use the Echo One, which connects with Amazon's Echo. I think that's probably a better way uh, to go. I have an issue with how clear and real sounding the voice is. I think it's kind of like an audio um, uncanny valley. Like it gets it's too creepy. real, it gets creepy. Yeah. Like that well, That guy sounds let's, let's, very uh, real. Hey, who's Leo Laporte? According to Wikipedia, Leo Gordon Laporte is an American technology broadcaster, author, entrepreneur, and head of Twit.tv. <laughs> <laughs> and likes to dance. So I, you're right. It's it's very realistic, right? Yeah. In fact, it wouldn't be an uncanny valley if it sounded like a robot. Right. It's so close to real, that, but you still your your mind goes that's that's creepy because mm -hmm. it's not real. And it's even more yeah. real with the things that it regularly says. You know, like I can't do that. <laughs> yeah, because they put a little lilt in it, yeah. right? Like listen to it when you turn them upside down. It sounds like there's a real human in there. Turn it all the way upside down. It, it, you can do that. That's, That's correct. Oh, this is yeah, correct? Yeah, so it looks like a regular speaker. You can have two yeah. of them. But if you do it this way... By the way, the Google Home is upside down. It will work best if you turn it over. It is creepy. Mm -hmm. I didn't think of it that way until you mentioned it, but it really will is. Will it play of... audiobooks? No, and that's what something Amazon has an advantage because they own Audible.com. Mm -hmm. I mean, it'll play podcasts, and if you have an audiobook podcast or something like that, it'll play it. Will it, it doesn't play, play audible.com. Will it play YouTube videos just so you could listen to them? I don't know. Hey, watch uh, Twit Live on YouTube. Sure, check out this Twit Live station on YouTube. That's Twit Live and Let Die. That's a different. <laughs> Is that what people are getting when we when I get like I love your station so much? That's it's, what they're talking. You, ever since you left the Beatles, it's <laughs> it's just yeah. All right. Well, we don't know why it did that, but that's uh, yeah, that's live the and let die. All. But it said the right thing, but then it played live and let die. Very weird. Twit live and let I'll die. Stick with that's Amazon. It just yeah. knows everything about me. Coming up, how do you get great pictures of Northern Lights? Dale Baskin from DP Review is a great photographer. He'll join us and. There are some tricks, and even if you don't live anywhere near the Northern Lights, which most of us don't, wait till you see his images. They're just gorgeous. But first, let's talk about the most expensive thing you will ever buy, a nuclear power station. No, your new home. <laughs> Actually, you might need a mortgage if you were going to buy a nuclear power station, too. And if you were going to get a mortgage, I would go to Rocket Mortgage. Actually, perfectly named for a nuclear power station purchase. When you are ready to buy that new home or refinance, by the way, interest rates going up. The Fed's already raised them a quarter of a point. They say three more hikes next year. Nice time to refi, lock in that great low interest rate. You're gonna to go to the best lender in the country, Quicken Loans. Number one in customer satisfaction, eight straight years, according to JD Power. That's as good as you can get. They also are highly technologically savvy. That's why they created Rocket Mortgage. They realized the home loan process was really stuck in the 19th century, you know. Uh, they needed a technological revolution, and they did. They put this all online, so that's the first thing. You don't have to go to a bank. You don't have to go get papers out of the cellar or the attic. You can do the whole thing on your phone. You can do it in an open house. You answer a few simple questions. Because of their trusted partnerships with all the financial institutions, they can get the information about you they need with your permission, and then crunch the numbers. And based on your income, your assets, your credit, it, they will offer you loans that are right for you. You choose the down payment, the interest rate, the term, and then the magic happens. Literally, within a couple of minutes, that big green button that says you're approved. That is an awesome feeling. You can download the approval letter, print it out, give it to your realtor. Sure, on the phone, just say, hey, look, see, we're approved, and, and, and you're in. You're done. It is Gosh, it's such an improvement over the way I bought a house last time. It is amazing. Rocket Mortgage, well-named, because it lifts the burden of applying for a home loan. They're from Quicken Loans. Apply simply, understand fully, mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash NSS. You can actually start the process, and then when you find a house, you like finish it up if you want. Rocketmortgage.com slash NSS. At least bookmark that. So when you get to that open house and you say, hey, honey, we should buy this, You'll be ready. Rocket Mortgage. 
Equal housing lender license in all 50 states. NMLSconsumeraccess.org number 3030. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Rocketmortgage.com slash NSS. And we thank them for their support of the new screensavers. Dale Baskin's back. One of our favorite photographers. He's from DP Review up in Seattle. Uh, best site in the world for figuring out what camera gear to buy. Hi, Dale. Hey, Leo. Hey, Megan. How are you guys? So you, uh, we're great. And uh, you went up. Where did you see the Northern Lights? I got to find out. Well, most recently, I went up to Yellowknife in Canada's Northwest Territories. And full disclosure, because I know you've mentioned my photos a couple of times here. A lot of the photos in the article are actually from my co-author on the article, uh, a guy named Jose Francisco Salgado, who is a world-class astrophotographer. Oh well, I take it and all back because Jose is a great photographer. You need to get some credit for these as well. Yeah, that's those... the first one you're looking at is his. That is amazing. Um, what? So Yellowknife, not, but you could also go anywhere north, right? Is that is that yeah. basically it? Yeah. The key is if, if you want to get photos of the Northern Lights, there's really only three ingredients. Uh, one is you need to be where you can see the Northern Lights. The second is you need to have a camera. And the third is probably a warmer shirt than you've got on right now. Yeah. Uh, as long as you've got those three things. But generally speaking, yes, if you want to see the very intense northern lights, you need to get up to where what we call the auroral band is located, which is 10, 20 degrees from the magnetic pole. So, you know, northern Canada, Alaska, the Yukon, Norway, that type of place. But during intense solar activity, certainly they will creep down into lower Canada, into the continental U.S. How do you find out where to go and when to when the best time to be there is? You know, that's that's a great question. Uh, it would that. depend on the area a little bit, uh, but there are some fantastic resources like websites. Uh, Spaceweather.com is Love fantastic. Love space weather. Yeah, we talked space about that. Spaceweather is fantastic. Yeah. You can actually get a rural forecast for wherever you're located. There are also some really good iPhone apps, and I, I don't want to endorse one or the other, but there's iPhone and Android apps that will give you alerts if there is a rural activity Ooh. likely to be seen in your area. Uh, the one you've got on screen is a fabulous one. I use it all the time. And if there is a rural activity, it will show you where it is and alert you if it's nearby. Now, so there's all, it's because it's near the magnetic North Pole, but I had heard that there were also Aurora Australis. There's Southern Lights, right? But that's different? <laughs> A absolutely. It's the same basic effect. Okay. Uh, it it's still the, the solar wind interacting with the mag Earth's magnetic, uh, excuse me, the Earth's magnetic field, uh, but it's the southern lights. It's Got a little it. harder to see because so much of the southern hemisphere is ocean. It's a little bit harder to go to some of those places. And of course, you've got to go somewhere that's not too populated because lights, light pollution is always the bane of astronomical photography. Yeah, and there's really two things you want to watch out for. One is light pollution from cities, man-made light pollution, and the other is the lunar cycle. You probably don't want to go when the moon is full because it will tend to drown out the lights. A little bit of moon is actually nice. It can actually illuminate the landscape and give you some very nice photos. Think of it as a fill light. Mm. It is. It, it can be very much a fill light for the landscape. Yeah. So I've been reading a lot about how, you know, the rise of Instagram and Facebook and everyone having a camera and taking photos. There's a lot of places that are like highly Instagrammed are getting overrun. Like, is that something that you have to worry about? Like the, in these places or like, is there special care you should go, you should take when you're, you're in these natural worlds that might not have had so many people before Instagram? You know, the, the beauty of the Northern Lights is it's not quite a single place. It's not like going to the Magic Castle at Disneyland or a, a famous natural landmark like a, a natural bridge in Utah. The Northern Lights span the entire hemisphere, at least between certain latitudes. So there's not one place you're going to go overpopulate or over photograph. There are certainly cities where there's a lot of tourism, like Tromsø, Norway, and that's very much an economic driver in that. some of those places. Mm. These are just but, stunning. Yeah. So they're, first of all, when you look at this, the first thing I, I think is, oh, they're so bright, that's easy. I could just take out my camera phone and get those. But the brightness varies. It does. If you're looking at the northern lights from, say, the northern continental US, when a rural activity is high, they won't be as bright as what you're seeing in the photos, although you can use your camera to expose for more light than your eye can see. To see the very bright aurora and the multicolored aurora that you're seeing in some of these photos, you really have to get up into that auroral band. And in fact, they can be as bright as you're seeing in the photos. I think wow. we've got a couple photos in here where you've got some purples, some, wow. um, some reds, and you really can see those very easily with your naked eye. I've always wanted to see these. Uh, so are these time uh, pictures? I mean, are they long exposure or 
Do these move? Tell me how you take these pictures. They, they absolutely move. Uh, the key is you need a camera that will capture the light. Generally, a, a full-frame camera with a bigger sensor is best. Yeah. Uh, but on my recent trip, I was with a friend who actually took one of these, a little Sony RX100, which I think you're familiar with. Great camera. And he got some fantastic Aurora photos with this little camera. Uh, honestly, the sensor quality is so good today yeah. that you really don't need the best camera. Uh, what you really need is a fast lens. Uh, and when we say fast, we don't mean a lens that moves particularly quickly. <laughs> we mean one with a big aperture that lets in a lot of light. Why a wide open uh, lens. And sure. I presume you're using wide angle lenses. Typically wide angle. You don't need to. Uh, photography is art. There's no right or wrong way to okay. do it, uh, just like any other art. <sighs> Here's the uh, movie. Here you're seeing a time lapse that my co-author Jose put together from some of his work. Um, so this is not real time. They don't move that fast. They don't shimmer that fast. Or you know, it's, it's a little bit hard to describe uh, unless you've seen them in, in person. This is sped up. This is a time lapse. But one of the challenges of photographing them is you really can't get exposure times that are short enough to see the very intricate movement. Uh -huh. There's very often rapid dancing around of the colors uh -huh. that you'll just never see in a still photo. So it's a little bit uh, uh, unreal, but at the same time, it's not. So if I'm going to travel to one of these places, maybe take one of these tours, what kind of gear would you recommend if someone's really serious and they want the, the really good lens? What, what would you recommend? Yeah, it's a great question. If you really want to get good photos, you want a camera with a large sensor, like a full frame sensor. Um, for example, I have a Nikon D750 here. Really good, great camera for doing it, but any camera with full frame sensor will do it. You'll also want a fast, wide lens. Uh, the lens I've got here, you can see it's got this big bulbous element in front. And this is a 14 millimeter, so very wide, f1.8 lens by a manufacturer called Sigma. So this will allow you to both collect a lot of light and also see a very large patch of the sky at the same time. This is actually one of your picks of the year, which surprised me because I always thought of Sigma as kind of a lower end budget priced lens manufacturer. It may have that reputation historically. Over the last few years, this is a company that has been incredibly focused on making high quality optics. Nice. And their approach is size, design, shape, be damned, we're going to make great optics. And, and if you get something from their art series, they are fantastic lenses. Wow, good to know. So what if you randomly find yourself and then all you have is your iPhone, is there any point in taking the picture or should you just watch it with your naked eyes and remember it in your brain? You know, one of the things, even when you're shooting this with a, a really great camera, sometimes you just have to step back and appreciate the natural phenomena for what it is. It's, it's Mother Nature's natural yeah. special effects show in the sky. Uh, but if they are bright, uh, during our trip to Yellowknife recently, uh, we ran into a local woman who had beautiful photos on her iPhone of the Aurora that she shot from a Walmart parking lot under sodium vapor lamps. So <laughs> if they are really bright, you can shoot them with your iPhone. Infinite focus? What do you focus on? Uh, you generally want to focus on infinity. Relative to your position, the, the lights are maybe 100, 120 kilometers up, somewhere in that range. So effectively, they're at infinity. So okay. what we typically do is we focus on a bright star. And that allows the heavens to be in focus. And the aurora, uh, focusing on aurora, it's kind of like focusing on smoke. So you, you don't yeah. really do it directly. You find uh, a proxy for it. Actually, if we were out of focus, you might, you might not really know. Right. Uh, you probably wouldn't, actually, yeah, except the yeah. stars might be uh, a little so bit So get blurred. the stars in focus and the rest will follow. More or less. Now, what's and, interesting and then, to me is uh, that this is, uh, what, what f-stop are you using? Because it looks, I mean, this, is, this looks like almost high dynamic range. The sky must be very bright relative to the ship. And I, how do you do this? Uh, really, it's very basic technique. What you want to do is get the exposure times as short as possible so that you minimize the movement of the aurora. Yeah. And you you're on your sticks. ISO. You're on a tripod, obviously. Oh, always yeah. on a tripod, yeah, yes. Yeah. Because in terms of exposure, you're talking about multiple seconds exposure, okay. Okay. anywhere from two to 10 seconds typically, but sometimes longer. And so what you do, you put it on a tripod. The foreground, whether it's a man-made object, a natural object will stay in one place and the aurora will move around, and you tend to use higher ISOs and wide apertures to let in as much light as possible. Uh, it, it's much easier than most people assume. Boy, these look great. And composition is obviously something you want to think about. Now, for this is just the sky, but so many of these other images have interesting backgrounds and foregrounds. Look at that. Yeah, and I, I have to point out a lot of these are my co-author's images. Jose, he, he goes all over the world to do this. Uh, but one of the things that he is a big proponent of is embrace the landscape, embrace yeah. man-made features. Yeah. Don't point it right at the sky because if you point right at the sky in Norway and right at the sky in Northern Canada, 
the sky looks the same. You're not getting right. a sense of place. You're not telling the story of where you are. Right. And you also don't get a sense of scale. It could be anything. So it's really nice to see those trees and then Absolutely. the sky. Boy, these are beautiful. Tell Jose, he's just a wonderful. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to get him on your network sometime. Yeah. He's a fantastic guy. Well, it's my, you know, it's funny. Since I've been a kid, and it must have been a kid's book or something that I read, I've always wanted to see the Aurora Borealis. And it's one of the many sites in the world I have yet to see. So I, maybe we'll do a trip well, you, up You should come with guys. us sometime, yeah. Leo. We would happy to do a oh, tour up there I, if you I want. I would really love to. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, thank you, Dale, and thanks, Jose, for those amazing images. Of course, you can read more about it at dpreview.com. And, uh, and I noticed that you guys were on an expedition. Uh, there's a company in those images that does these, so you could even find out about that, I would presume. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Dale Baskin. Really thank nice to guys. talk to you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks, Boy, Dale. that makes me want to go. That's so cool. Coming up, oh, I am so excited. You know, you may remember we did a, a bit a while ago uh, with Topher White about the Rainforest uh, Network and how they were putting, using old beat up cell phones to put cameras in the trees to watch for illegal logging activity to help save the rainforest. Well, when Topher came up, he brought a friend of his. I was talking to her for a little bit. Turns out she's a nuclear scientist, a doctorate from uh, MIT. And uh, we, we got to talking about her startup they're building small scale, they plan to build small scale nuclear power plants. So we'll be talking to Leslie Dewan, the CEO of a startup that's going to go nuclear. That's my prediction. <laughs> but first, let me talk about how to get your internet right. I had a call on the radio show earlier today. A guy was asking about one of these devices. There's a lot of them that you now put in your network to protect yourself against malware and, you know, viruses and phishing scams. and you know, keep your kids safe, that kind of thing. And I said, wait a minute, why get a separate device? What you really need is Eero. Eero solves so many Wi-Fi problems. Problem number one, bad connectivity, buffering, internet stalls, low bandwidth. And that's because your old router just isn't up to the task. We're doing more and more with Wi-Fi. We need more and more capabilities. Eero is absolutely the solution. That's what I've been using in my house. In fact, I liked it so much, I got the new Eros with these Eero beacons you plug into the wall. It's three times faster than the old Eero, now tri, or twice as fast, now tri-band, three bands. Works great for all my devices. I have more than 60 devices now on my network, <laughs> including IoT devices. It handles it. It handles it great and gives me consistent bandwidth everywhere in the house. I love it. I, it looks good, too. Like It doesn't, it doesn't it, look like a router. Yeah, in fact, the, those uh, beacons have a nightlight feature, so I put those in the hall so they light up the night. They light up the hall, and then I can also get bandwidth all over the house. We have a almost a 4,000-square-foot house, and it really ha I, I've never had a good system until we got the Euros. But as I said, I had the old Euros. I gave those to my mom. She's using them. She has five Euros because she has upstairs, downstairs, basement, outside. It solves all her problems. Uh, in fact, it's so good that I now have to get her a new cable modem because the Euros are faster than the cable modem. I gotta get her a Doxus 3 cable modem. The other thing though, it does all of the security stuff. And this is great. If you go in, you can name every device, you can assign every device to individual users. So our 14 year old Michael, I have all his devices, his phone, his tablet, his computer labeled, and I can actually say, pause Michael's Wi-Fi. I can do it with my Amazon Echo, pause Michael's Wi-Fi. That's pretty amazing. It also protects him uh, against sites, illegal sites, gambling sites, sexy sites. We keep them off of those. But it protects us, too, against malware, against phishing. The Eero Plus security is fantastic. And as with all of the Eero, updates happen automatically and regularly. I'll give you an example. Remember when we found out about the crack Wi-Fi vulnerability? Within 24 hours of its public reveal, Eero had a patch in place and every single Eero user was safe. Within 24 hours, this is what you need. No more buffering, no more dead zones, Wi-Fi that works. And we've got a good deal, free overnight shipping to the US or Canada. You visit Eero.com, pick the package you want. You can start with a, a Eero base station and two beacons. Uh, you can add beacons as you need them. You can start with two, it's just whatever you need. I would say a, an Eero for every 1500 square feet in your house. And then put check overnight shipping as you check out and put NSS in the promo code and that'll make whoop, make it zero for the overnight shipping. EERO.com, offer code NSS. Folks, I've tried them all. And 
the one I use is Eero. That really says it all, right? E-E-R-O dot com. Don't forget the offer code. N-S-S. Transatomic power. I can't wait. We're going to talk to Dr. Leslie Dewan in just a second. But first, Jason Howell. Don't worry, no spoilers here. He's going to review the new Star Wars augmented reality headset from Lenovo. Watch. <laughs> Okay, yes, we're all, like, super excited to watch the new Star Wars film, The Last Jedi, but that's just two and a half hours of our life. What about the rest of the time? How could we possibly obsess over the Star Wars universe when we aren't paying $13 a ticket? How about instead picking up this piece of kit to fill the gaps? This is the Star Wars Jedi Challenges bundle that looks a whole heck of a lot like a virtual reality rig. It's actually a highly customized smartphone-fueled gaming system, similar to like a Daydream or a Gear VR viewer, but it has some distinct differences. Namely, this is more about augmented reality, which will have you layering the Star Wars universe over the top of, let's say, the rug in your living room. You'll walk through a somewhat cumbersome guided setup. You actually have to put your compatible smartphone, of which Disney says the last couple of years of smartphones are compatible, both iOS and Android. You actually have that resting inside of the visor. And then these mirrors project the interface and gaming elements into the same field of view as, well, everything else that happens to be in your room. As a result, it feels less like a VR headset and more like something like Microsoft's HoloLens. I found the head strap to be just a little bit uncomfortable. It took a while to dial it in, but I was able to manage. You also get this impressively convincing lightsaber with an illuminated tip that helps with AR tracking while you're playing the game, along with a few control buttons on the side. You will absolutely feel like a Jedi holding this lightsaber. It's very well made. And finally, you get this glowing beacon that you can place on the floor in the center of your space. This is actually how all of that AR content is pinned to the ground where you are and acts as the center for that content. So you can quite literally walk around the room, kind of like a low rent tracking camera that you might get with the big VR rigs like the Rift or the Vive. Now, once you've maneuvered through all of that setup and everything is working as designed, you have three games to get started with. The first, I would say, is probably the most enjoyable. It's the lightsaber battle. I will initiate you to the dark side. Where you'll challenge a huge host of notable baddies from the Star Wars universe. You'll slice them up, you'll ricochet their shots, you might even block their own attacks in a certain sequence sort of way. It's incredibly satisfying, especially considering the AR lightsaber overlaid on top of that great hardware that's sitting in your hands right there works together pretty solidly save for a little bit of lag here and there. It's a lot of fun. This isn't how I thought it would end. There's also a strategy game that you'll want to place on the ground to manage as if you're in God mode, looking down on all the troops, and the adats, and all sorts of other things engaging in an all-out battle. You command the action from above, placing different turrets and offensive swarms around the map to deal with the incoming wave of those enemies. Real-time strategy fans are going to enjoy the holographic approach. And finally, it wouldn't be complete without the hollow chess that we've all dreamed about playing from episode four, A New Hope. Good thing you aren't playing against an actual Wookiee. They've been known to pull arms out of sockets if they lose. But it is too bad that you can't match up with real human opponents, though Disney has said that it's working on multiplayer capability. I will say that tracking wasn't always perfect. I noticed a little bit of drift at times, but worse than that is a general state of wobbliness with the image and that got a bit annoying over time uh, also there were moments when the interface got lost altogether and i had to reset the game to find it again in my space but the ar effect when it's working is pretty convincing and disney says it has around 12 hours of solid gameplay so for 199 dollars which is a little steep you have a good amount to keep you busy at least until you decide to buy another ticket for the last jedi I'm Jason Howell, and you can catch me on All About Android and Tech News Weekly here on Twit.tv. He didn't look at all, Jordan. No. I think, no, this is good. Yeah. <laughs> Let the Wookiee win, right? That's the advice. I think that's the key to the whole thing. Oh, I'm very excited. We have, I probably should take this probably off. Probably you should take them off. All right. We have Dr. Leslie du Duan with us. She is the co-founder and CEO of a company. You started it, right? I did, yeah. Called Transatomic. Uh, your startup that uh, looks to offer clean, safe, affordable nuclear power. We don't usually think of nuclear power as clean, safe, and affordable, though. What we want to do ultimately is 
make the type of nuclear reactor that people could plausibly want to have in their backyards or even, or nuclear reactors that people would want to have in their communities, reactors that can play nice in a grid that has a lot of solar and wind and storage and just figure out better ways of making carbon-free electricity. Com countries like Germany are phasing out nuclear. Yeah. What is the desire, why would you want to phase in nuclear? In fact, uh, one, one of our visitors is actually uh, working for a Canadian power company that's building a nuclear power plant, yeah. Why would you want to use nuclear energy? What are the advantages? So nuclear is really good at producing very large amounts of baseload carbon-free electricity. So um, just always on constant carbon-free electricity. Like even in the US right now, it produces um, just about two thirds of our emissions free electricity. And you know, there's some countries that are phasing out nuclear power. Um, there have been a lot of shutdowns of US reactors over the past few years. These are older um, reactors, of course. Yeah, a lot of yeah. the older generation of reactors yeah. that are now around 40 years old. Um, Switzerland is phasing it out. Germany is phasing it out as well. But countries like China are starting massive build programs of new types of nuclear reactors, like both building up sort of the conventional, like older generation light water reactor technology and also putting in a lot of money into new advanced reactor tech. Um, like right now in the US, there are 99 operating nuclear power reactors. Um, in China, I think there are around 40, 44 that are operating right now and then plans for uh, another 40 or 50 in the coming decades. So would a large your, number under construction as well. Would your plan to be to stay in the United States or go to a place like China that's building more quickly? We want to focus on the U.S. market first, and again, this is still in the in the multi-decade timescales before we'd be able to bring something like this to fruition. But we see a lot of the market being in the U.S. as this country shuts down its existing coal power plants. We want to have a new type of nuclear technology that can fill that gap um, within the electric grid in the future. Um, but more broadly, like so much of the market is in um, the parts of the world that are developing really rapidly and increasing their electricity needs really rapidly. So in China and India and Brazil are enormous markets for so new types of We've seen horrific power. pollution in Delhi, we've seen horrific pollution in China because of coal powered plants. Mm -hmm. So this would be less of an environmental impact. And your plants are safer and cleaner than these 40 year old plants were decommissioning, right? Yeah, that was one of the main things that we were focusing on when we started the company. So my co-founder and I, we both became nuclear engineers because we're environmentalists. And we feel that if you can make a better form of nuclear power, one that addresses the existing issues of safety and waste and proliferation and cost, then you'd be able to do something that's that's really good for the world and producing large amounts of emissions free electricity. Right, um, right. So the particular technology that we're working on, we figured out a way so that it produces less than half of the waste of the existing light water reactors that are the majority of the world's fleet today. And um, it has some tremendous safety benefits as well. So when we were talking earlier, you, I mean, you started this company while you, right before you got your PhD, yeah. and uh, instead of becoming a physicist, but you have, this is old technology, right? I mean, this isn't some, this is something that has been around, but not brought to true fruition. Like you're talking about, you've talked to like 60, 70 year olds in the lab who came up with some of these ideas. Exactly. Yeah. And that's one of the things that makes me so excited about it. So the, the genesis of this technology, um, it came about in the 1950s and 1960s. So they, um, primarily researchers at the Oak Ridge National Lab in Tennessee, came up with a design for a liquid fueled reactor. So it used liquid uh, molten salts actually as fuel rather than the solid uranium oxide fuel rods of traditional reactors today. And that gives it some fantastic safety benefits. So they, they built a prototype um, at Oak Ridge in the 1960s. They operated it for several years and they showed that this type of reactor effectively couldn't melt down, even in the worst case scenario accident. It was extremely robust. It didn't even have to have any operators on site in order to safely shut itself down. Mm -hmm. But when they figured this out, this was um, in late 1960s, early 1970s. It was before there had been any significant nuclear accidents. This design back then was experimental. It was expected to be fairly expensive. It required highly enriched uranium as fuel. And there effectively was a decision made that said like, well, we don't 
need this safer nuclear reactor. The ones that we have are safe enough, and it got put on the back burner effectively for many decades. And it's only fairly recently that a number of companies, including Transatomic, have started um, pursuing it much more aggressively and figuring out ways to optimize the design. So are you dealing with a lot of fear? I mean, it sounds like it's just the... Yeah, I'm scared. Of the, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> because of the accidents, we just think, oh, no, 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 that's too yeah, scary. Chernobyl, like, Fukushima. Yeah. Uh, is that what you're Island. trying to work against? Just people's just general fear of something that might not actually be true? So I think what makes nuclear accidents tricky, I mean, so if you look at the, you know, at the hard numbers and not to come across as callous, but if you just look at the, you know, the death rates per, per terawatt hour of power produced for different forms of power generation, um, coal is by far the most deadly um, because of coal mining collapses and even not taking into account um, respiratory illnesses mm -hmm. that are caused by coal power pollution. And then right after coal, you have um, deaths from oil power production, natural gas production, um, even with solar and wind. Like I'm a very strong supporter of solar and wind, but you still get deaths, for example, from rooftop solar. Like I guess per terawatt of energy produced, you have about like 0.1 or so deaths. Um, People falling off the roof and stalling them? Exactly, yeah. Holy and then cow. similarly with wind turbines. Right. And then nuclear is an order of magnitude safer than that. And so you can look at those numbers and say like, oh, well, of course nuclear is safe. But with a nuclear accident, if there's an accident at one plant, it affects a broader area. And that, I think, really changes the perception of, of what it means. Um, for, for a nuclear accident. Some of it's just techno panic, reason. though, because of the scary atomic. I guess the other yeah. issue uh, is waste. And, and nuclear waste is poisonous for tens of thousands of years, right? How do you handle the waste issue? The nuclear waste issue, I think, is one of the biggest hurdles that nuclear power has to overcome. And so with our technology, we're able to greatly reduce the amount of waste that's being produced. So we have less than half of the long-lived waste as compared to a conventional reactor. But there's still a lot of research needed to figure out how you can best store that over long periods of time. And there's you know, some progress in the US side with the Yucca Mountain um, facility and the waste isolation pilot plant as well. But I think we can look towards other best practices examples of waste facilities in, um, in Scandinavia in particular. Um, there's some good ways of storing it. There's a deep borehole technology where you um, can drill many kilometers into the ground to isolate the waste that way. So it's it's a solvable problem, and I think that it just needs more um, more attention being paid to it, or just more like more engineers and more and more technical eyes yeah. on it as instead of just the solution saying no we can't do that it's too dangerous and just walking away. It makes sense to have this in your arsenal of power alternatives to coal, to natural gas. Uh, but ultimately, do you see renewables as the long-term future, or is this just a stopgap nuclear power, or do you think this will be hand-in-hand -hand with renewables? I think that there's a lot of room for nuclear to go hand-in-hand -hand with renewables. Like, when I think about the electric grid of the future, I think you want to have a lot of solar, a lot of wind. You need very good forms of storage so you can level out um, what the curves look like. Batteries or some other mm -hmm. means, yeah. Exactly, yeah, or pumped hydro storage right. or something along those lines for grid scale. And I think that there's room for advanced nuclear technologies to be part of the mix because, I mean, really, in the years following um, Three Mile Island and uh, following Chernobyl and even to some degree following Fukushima, there was um, a, a quelling, a dying down of research into advanced mm -hmm. nuclear reactors. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of only now that there's a large number of... Um, Oh, you know, actually, sorry. So you can you can think about it these ways. So if you look at a graph of the ages of nuclear engineers, it's this really, really bifurcated curve that you can <laughs> see. So you have a lot of nuclear engineers who are in their 70s or 80s who are, you know, retiring Did towards the, early the end research. of their careers. Yes, yeah. who, yeah. like, originated this field, the who 50s. were there from yeah. the very, very beginning when yeah. you first started having nuclear power. And then there's a gap in the middle with hardly anyone. And then it starts to pick up again. And it's you your have, generation. Yeah, right? So, you How have did you, of, so you're studying at MIT. What are you studying as a PhD student? You're studying nuclear physics? When I, when I was at MIT, I did my undergrad in nuclear engineering and mechanical engineering. And did you just um, run into this? And, I mean, at first, you probably had the same reaction we do. Oh, nuclear power, it's over. When did, when did your mind flip on that? How did that happen? 
I think a lot of it would be when I came back to grad school, I started talking a lot with my co-founder and we were, we were actually in some of the libraries reading a lot of old documents. Um, this is actually, it was when we were studying for our qualifying exams and um, we would take like brief breaks from studying for quals, reading nuclear docs in the library and because um, that way we could take a break without feeling guilty. And, um, <laughs> still learning, right. I'm still reading. Yeah. <laughs> And we were so struck by the difference in tone in this older set of documents. Like you'd look at reports from the 50s and 60s and there was optimism. Like they were oh, talking yeah. about nuclear powered cars, nuclear powered airplanes, like they had just built nuclear powered submarines. And it was this sense of like blue sky thinking like, right. oh, we'll make, you know, reactors cooled by liquid mercury. Right. We'll make liquid fueled reactors. Or Mr. Fusion as mm -hmm. in Back to the Future, right? Exactly. Yeah. And there was this sense of like, we want we want to be like that. We want yeah. to um, we want to try new things and do new things. And um, the nice the nice thing about the position that that we are in now, and that all of this sort of new generation of nuclear engineers is in now, is that we can take a lot of advances from other fields. We can take the past fifty years of advances in material science. We can take all of the computer codes that exist now right. that they didn't right. have in the 50s and 60s and use it to optimize the design and make it better. So it's like a really, really rich space well, to be working in. You've got containment vessels that are atmospheric pressure instead of high pressures. You have mm -hmm. to have a big dome. You have, uh, new, well, and we saw some of these pictures of these these new designs. Mm -hmm. They really look amazing. The salt instead of the enriched fuel rods which eliminate, you don't have to have external power to keep it cool. That's was a problem at Fukushima, right? Is they couldn't, they were gonna get a runaway because they were, had lost power, right? Exactly, yeah, in a lot of the conventional reactors, you need a constant supply of external electric power. Cool. Exactly, so you can keep pumping water over the fuel or right. else it heats up too much and right. has a meltdown. But with the liquid fueled reactors, you, you don't need that. It has totally different awesome. cooling requirements. So where are you now? First of all, one thing I think is interesting, this is open, right? You're not keeping this a secret. You're not doing this in private. This, you're open publishing your, your results. Yeah, we've been moving to open publish um, as much of our work as possible. So we have a few technical white papers out on our website. And then um, also if you go to the website uh, osti.gov, otc.gov, you can, osti.gov rather, you can um, see some of the reports that we've worked on in conjunction with the Oak Ridge National Lab that goes into a lot of detail of the 2D and 3D simulations of the core as well. If you search uh, transatomic January uh, 2017 or maybe December 2016 was the first paper and then the most recent one was uh, September of this year. Now, right now this is funded by grants from the Department of Energy and other places, right? We have some grants that have come in from DOE yeah. and we're also funded by private venture capital Oh, as so well. you have investors as well. Yeah, yeah. Peter Thiel's Founders Fund no is, kidding. Um, is one of our main investors. How interesting. And what is the time frame for this? I mean, when right now you're designing, thinking about it, where do you stand now and how far before we start building these? So it's long time scales here. So we um, right now are focusing on design for a smaller scale prototype facility, sort of validating and one. refining that design. Okay. Well, actually, that's kind of step one. We're also closing out step zero here, basically, if we want to index it that way. Um, so we're doing um, some lab scale tests, uh, a set of that that we're just finishing up now looking at corrosion, because with these these liquid fuels, the molten salt fuels, you. Um, Care really a lot corrosive. about making sure yeah. exactly. Yeah. They're well, they're corrosive. They're also at around 650 degrees Celsius, and they're radioactive at the same time. Great. So yeah, my What's background that? is in nuclear materials engineering, <laughs> and so it's an interesting. I problem. bet it's an interesting problem. Yeah. yeah. So um, when you're trying to get funding, I mean, is it is it you're in Silicon Valley where they're like you need to have you know a million followers by next year? Like, I mean, is it difficult to convince them of these long term investments are worthwhile? It was it was really interesting for us when we started doing fundraising for this a few years back because I um, you know I didn't I didn't at the time have much of an entrepreneurial background and I would talk to some companies and they would they would be really enthusiastic about the, te about the technology but they'd say like oh this is great we'll fund you like can you have one in six months <laughs> and said so, no like it's going to take ten years it's going to take yeah. fifteen years literally <laughs> yeah. to make this happen and. Um, we realized like at the time there were hardly any other nuclear startups so there weren't very many other um, like sorts of existence proofs that we could look at mm -hmm. and we said okay well we want to look at what aerospace startups are doing mm -hmm. because that's kind of similar 
uh, long timelines, larger dollar amounts, like big technology pieces. Um, you know, Founders Fund was one of the early investors in SpaceX, and we talked to them. They actually, on their website at the time, they had a picture of the nuclear-powered airplane <laughs> on their site. And we we kind of knew from that, that there might be um, yeah. some, some good connections yeah. there. Well, You're I mean, not alone now. There's over 100 startups in yeah, this field. Now worldwide, um, over 100 advanced nuclear startups. Um, so cool. Collectively, yeah. I think we've... Um, collectively, there's been about $1.6 billion in private capital that have gone into so advanced nuclear So there's some real worldwide. sense that this is real, this could be a big thing, and it's something that we should investigate uh, for our energy future along with these other uh, mm. technologies. Yeah. yeah, it's not bad if Silicon Valley slowed down a little bit. It's nice. I mean, the move fast and break things ethos. Don't break this thing. No. <laughs> Keep this maybe, thing in yeah, maybe we So when am I going to have a nuclear reactor in my backyard? That's what I want. Yeah. Oh, Six man. months. Or at least, or a car, or a plane. So We have been submarines. It's not that strange. Inside right? the iPhone? Yeah. Or in the uh, iPhone. If we could make one as small as that, <laughs> that would be amazing. I'm sure you um, could. <laughs> so we want to break ground on the prototype facility in the early 20s, early next decade. Early then, 2020s. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's okay. going to be a long time horizon. Yeah. And then you have to build that, operate that right. for a number of years to collect the data, um, all the while interfacing with the Nuclear Regulatory the Commission to show them that it is working the way that you right. expect it to work and only following that following that, would we be able to build the full-scale facility? This is appropriate. Megawatts this electric. is appropriate. Yeah. Uh, you want to do this cautiously, but you have to take the first steps now, or it won't be ready in the 2020s or the 2030s or the 2040s. We need to begin now. I think that's great. So congratulations. <laughs> well done. You're going to be doing, you, 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 are you comfortable doing this for the rest of your life? Because that's what it sounds like. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just about the most fascinating field to be in because it's it's interesting physics, it's interesting engineering. It's it's neat from a regulatory standpoint too. There's it's a lot you know, of there's a lot of cool pieces that come into involved, it. Yeah, and then you have to raise money. And and Peter's pretty comfortable with the 2020 time frame. He's not freaking out. <laughs> they're they're good with the timeline. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so nice to meet you, Dr. Leslie Dewan. She is the co-founder and CEO of Transatomic. What's the website if people want to go? Uh, transatomicpower.com is the website. And is there stuff there that a, that a dummy like me could read and learn, <laughs> learn from? Yes, in yeah. fact, I read it. Oh, oh good. Yeah. <laughs> really neat. Re I think really exciting. It's so nice to have you back. Thank you for coming by. Thank you so she much. Thank Topher. you for having me here. My pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I want one in my backyard. Or a car would be okay. A submarine? Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, is they're the building Ford nuclear. Fusion, which the Ford was, Fusion yeah. literally has Mr. Fusion. <laughs> right. Uh, these are all fission reactors, obviously. Yeah, these are fission yeah, reactors, sorry. Fission there was, um, yeah, the Ford Nucleon, rather, sorry, was their... Um, Imaginary uh, yeah. concept. Uh, yeah. yeah. They but built a little nuclear, model of it. There, nuclear submarines have little mini nuclear power plants in them, right? Yep. Is that the old school technology? So they're most similar to the old school technology. Yeah. Um, I mean, the U.S. got nuclear-powered submarines up and running Soon. first. Quick. And then right. it's actually, like, is there another minute or so for yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm fantastic. fantastic. <laughs> awesome. Okay. We're, so, we're um, waiting until the 2020s. We're yeah, we got lots of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so the first nuclear-powered submarine was the USS Nautilus. Um, right. That, I guess, um, was commissioned in 1954, I believe. Okay. And then... Um, Immediately after that, the U.S. wanted to get commercial nuclear power up and running as quickly as possible. And as a point of national pride, the goal was we're going to get this running before the USSR does. Right. And so um, the nuclear-powered submarines, they're perfect, beautiful machines. The reactors in them are optimized for use in a submarine. And so um, to get commercial power up and running on land, the U.S. effectively took this submarine reactor... <laughs> put it on land instead of spending another decade or two yeah. optimizing a land-based reactor. Yeah. And it, you know, it works. It works well. They're great yeah. for, you know, So you mean the power plants we see today are based on nuclear power plants from submarines? They, they evolved out of the submarine How reactors. They were developed first for the yeah. submarines. Of course, they had ample seawater to cool it with. They exactly. Have, yeah, worst case scenario easier. accident in a submarine, you're not going to run right. out of water. But right. one, of the, one of the reasons, to some degree, why the conventional nuclear reactors that are built today are so expensive is that you need um, you need all of these backup safety systems. Right. You need um, all of the facilities to ensure that you have um, the right because amount of, of water Because of fuel on rods, site. because of a high pressure and all of the, the different technologies that these nuclear submarines used. We, but we can do it better. 
Exactly. Yeah, and that's what um, a lot of the advanced reactor companies exactly. like Transatomic are doing. Say, all right, we're just going to go back to a much earlier part yeah. of the technology tree and see if we can suss out How something else. So the submarines actually are part of the conversation. That's very mm -hmm. interesting. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Nice to have you, Dr. Dewan. Really appreciate it. Thank we're going to take so a break. When we come back, uh, we've got a call for help, believe it or not, and I want to do that. But first, a word from WordPress. Did you know 29% of all the websites in the world run on WordPress? 29%. Not a surprise. I've been using WordPress since practically it was invented. Matt Mullenweg, early days, said, I'm making a blog. I want to try this WordPress. I was running on my own server. But the problem was I found I was spending more time tweaking the server, putting in patches, than actually blogging. Along comes WordPress.com. They do all the hard part for you. They keep it running. They keep it secure. They keep the patches going, keep the plugins flowing. And you get to focus on making a great website for your home, for your business, for your blog, for your kids. It is the best place to start your website. Go to wordpress.com slash NSS and save 15% off any new plan purchase. You don't need experience. If you have a business and you don't have a website, go there, make that website because then your customers can find you, they can learn about you, and they can share a word about you because those social plugins on WordPress.com make it easy for them to tell their friends about your business. Built-in search engine optimization. Their customer support team is the best, and they're there 24 hours a day, Monday through Friday, and on weekends too. And I've used many, uh, I've called them and written them and chatted with them many times, and they're really fantastic. Plans start as low as $4 a month. See why 29% of the web runs on WordPress.com. I was just, you know, you know who uses WordPress.com? I was just reading a Facebook research paper. Facebook has a WordPress.com site to publish their results. It's in WordPress. WordPress.com slash Facebook does it. You should do it. Facebook, me, me. what more could you ask? I have Megan, WordPress.com slash NSS, and you'll get 15% off your brand new site. We thank WordPress so much for making the new screensavers possible. Now it's time for a call for help. On the line with us right now from Long Beach, California, it's Lou with a question for you. Hi, Lou. Hi, Lou. Hi, Leo. Hi, Megan. <laughs> World Series of Poker. Are you a poker player or a poker watcher? A little of both. But I, not quite at that level. I love poker, but I, I, I like to keep the table stakes down to quarters because I would lose my shirt if I were playing <laughs> big stakes. It's fun, though, isn't it? Oh, it, it's a great time. Yeah. Uh, the, half the fun of playing poker is, is actually the fun of uh, being with people and just, uh, you know, the conversations that take place. It's a social. Yeah. You know what? That's when I, I play with buddies. It's a social event. It really is fun. So what can we do for you, Lou? Well, um, I'm a big Surface fan. I uh, have my Surface Pro that I actually bought the first day it came out. But it's uh, it's starting to go out on me. And what I've really wanted over the last couple of years has been a Surface Book. Mm. And I know that Megan has your old Surface Book. She's so I had inquired a couple of weeks ago. Uh, what she thought of it is uh, as a possible replacement for my uh, ancient, ancient Surface Pro. You don't want to get the new Surface Book 2, you want to get the original Surface Book. I, I would love the new one. The, it, it's a little bit pricey yeah. for yeah. what I can afford right now. Is Microsoft still selling this first generation? Refurbished. Ah. Right, that's what you're yeah. looking for, used or refurbished. Oh, that's not used bad or, at all. Used or refurbished. 256 yeah. gigs, um, i5, 969. That's so, like half off. Yeah, almost. and I, I clicked on five uh, find in store, and they they they're selling them locally here. I mean, you know, you 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 know where to buy one if you uh, if you want one. You're just trying to figure out if it's worth it. So let me just tell you my yeah. experience, and then Megan can tell you hers, because I got it when it first came out, and it was a troubled platform. Both Paul Thorat and I were complaining it wouldn't. You'd put it in your bag, and it would suddenly turn on, and you'd take it out of the bag with zero battery life left and the thing was hot and blazes because it didn't shut down right. Uh, Microsoft said this was a tough computer science problem because of the Skylake processor in there. They didn't really understand power management, but it took them about eight months. But in the eight months after it came out, 
We got patch after patch. And by the time I gave it to you, I think they'd fixed all those problems. I think it was pretty reliable. Has that been your experience? It's been reliable. Um, it has, but it's not been the computer that I go to regularly. And Is that because it's Windows or because yes. it's... Yes. Oh. <laughs> well, but, so but that's, that's not, why that, that's not I, Lou's problem. No, he likes that is Windows. Not, no, no. Yeah. And that's why, you know me, I am not going to tell you, yes, you should buy this. Yes, you should buy that. It's such a feeling. Like, I, when I've... We've conversed for a while, Lou, and I feel like you just really want this. Like, you feel very attached then get it. to the fact that you got the other one on the first day. So, Megan, let's just send him yours. You don't okay, like okay, it. Okay, that is where I wanted to end this. So, I did ask Windows Expo. Okay, it's I'll going. tell you the problem with it. I'll tell you the problem with it that is maybe still a little unresolved. Microsoft had a lot of problems. But make, make it one of the cool, coolest things mm -hmm. is this is a detachable screen. So... In order for this to work, this is very much like your Surface Pro, by the way. That screen is pretty much the same screen. It has battery. There's more battery in the keyboard. And the weird thing, and this is the thing I think Microsoft felt challenged by, is the keyboard has the GPU in it as mm -hmm. well. So suddenly when you detach this, this whole computer kind of has to reconfigure itself to use the the Iris Intel Iris GPU instead of the NVIDIA right. GPU. Right, I tapped on it. I wanted the keyboard to pop up like my iPad. That yeah, means. you can set it so that it's uh, that it goes into tablet mode when you turn it off. This also has some other advantages. You can put it on backwards, then fold it down. It's really kind of a neat convertible. It also, in order to do that, they had to do this weird hinge design. The scorpion hinge. Is that what they call that? Yeah. Yeah, because it stings. Um, so I did ask people who love Windows. Brad Sams said There's he a good also guy. said he doesn't recommend it. He said, like you, that the Skylake processors are sketchy, um, and he wouldn't. You know, he, he said he recommended um, a lot of other. The HP 360 is cheaper, um, and or the Surface Laptop. Would you recommend that over you, the Surface Book? Lou, do you like your Surface Pro? I mean, is, you're really into the Surface, is that it? I, I, I really like it. I say yeah. I've had it since day one. Uh, I like the one of the things I really liked about the Surface Book was the ability. You know, I'm done working. I'm a, I'm a programmer. I, ah, I spend a lot of right. time. Uh, the Visual down Studio? Or are you or a C Sharp yes. guy? Or okay. Yeah, absolutely. So that so that's guy. why you have to use Windows. I mean, that's really the yeah. platform. Well, I'm not yeah, trying to convince them to use Mac. I also like the thought of Mac. being able to pop the, the screen off and you know go in the Carry other room and yeah. watch something on TV. Uh, we're cord cutters, so I've got uh, I've got the YouTube TV and uh, a couple of other subscriptions that I watch on tablet. So my tablet is my computer. And does the Surface still do all that for you? Just I mean, I know the does well, it still he, do. Well, you got like, the original one, which is pretty old now. It it is. I have I have the i5 and it it does still work. The the problem I'm having is the uh, sometimes the power doesn't want to turn on, yeah. which is a problem with the yeah. computer. Yes. <laughs> but that's almost five also years the, old. That can be. Yeah. I mean, that's a yeah. That's I I it, it's been a really great computer for me. I use it almost every day. Well, what you like about this? This is essentially a Surface. If you just take that screen off, it is the same great three by two screen that the modern Surface Pro. Not the current Surface Pro, but the Surface Pro 4 comes with. So it's a very nice, rock-solid, beautiful LCD screen. Uh, it is a little heavy for a tablet because, of yeah. course, it has to have all that functionality built into the top. It's not in the keyboard. It's up here except for the GPU and the extra battery. Uh, right. So and Brad didn't like it. Who else didn't like it? Well, Padre didn't like it, and he Padre recommended, like, like I think, an Acer... Um, not the Chromebook, but the... You the know who didn't like it? He gave it away. Leo didn't like it. Yeah, he gave yeah. it to... <laughs> no, I did, actually, I liked it. Uh, I got the Surface laptop, and so I didn't need this anymore. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you, you said, I need a Windows machine. I said, this would be a good choice for mm -hmm. you. Uh, Paul Theratz doesn't still use his Surface book. He's moved on. He has Lenovo, uh, which is also a very good choice. And the Lenovo makes some very nice two-in-ones. They don't detach, but they fold over. Uh, remember, we showed you the Lenovo uh, 920 which is fairly inexpensive, under $1,000. has that weird hinge, mm -hmm. but I think is a very good Yeah, maybe choice. that was what. Well, my, my issue is that there were a lot of people on Twitter who said, you know, I got it and I returned it because it was so buggy. There were several people but that, there. But that was the early days. Right. It's been fixed since then. I don't, May, right. So it's all been fixed since then. I wanted to reach out to Megan to in, find out 
What yeah. condition is it in now? Do you yeah. have you, no, you, you know, enough to well, run into the Well, I don't program bugs. on it, but I do yeah. all the things I do. You know, I use Google Sheets and all the things that I could use a Chromebook for. Um, I, you know, my kids have used it. One of the big problems w was when you detached it, it would get confused, and when you reattached it, it get confused. That's gone. It's not doing that. It, I love the pencil. I think if you do any drawing or mm -hmm. sketching or annotating, the pencil is really great. Or watching Netflix. Uh, it'd be great for watching Netflix. I've used it for that. It works great. Yeah. <laughs> I so to to answer that question, Lou, I think those bugs have been ironed out. I really do. I don't think those bugs persist. The the people that you hear that you that heard was, from, I think we're more complaining about the form factor and the fact that it is pricey given what else is out there. There's so many manufacturers in Windows in the Windows space that you really kind of have an unlimited choice in form factor and price and style. Uh, did you see our piece last week on the crowdsourced tablet, the Eve V? I did, and I was very intrigued by that. That was However, beautiful. In, in, in my history, I, I was buying notebooks for a company back east about 10, 15 years ago. And I bought a number of them from this company, and all of a sudden, they weren't there anymore. Yeah. And, and we don't know how long concern. this company's going to yeah. be around. They are crowdsourced. Well, that was my issue with buying a used one from somebody, too. You can't just say, like, I'm sending this Microsoft back. will be around. If it's a refurbished from Microsoft. They'll yeah. be around. What yeah, do you feel of, in yeah. your heart, Lou? What do you feel in your heart? Look in your heart. What do you think you should get? <laughs> I don't know. That's, uh, I, oh. I, you know, based on the... If he had heart, he wouldn't be a programmer. Be... <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> I didn't say, I didn't, he didn't mean that. Oh, I'm um, sorry, Lou. Oh, I didn't mean it. But you have kids too, right? You have kids that you want to go, go that you want to send them to I, college and such. Yeah, I do have a daughter who's going to be starting college next year. So there's um, cost issues. So I'm kind of what's your budget? Testing the water, if you will. What's your budget? Around a thousand dollars. I think there's so many somewhere good somewhere in that neighborhood. Well, that refurbished Surface Book was a thousand dollars, but then there's also the seven hundred dollar you know notebook. That's also convertible that Padre recommended. Is 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 it really important to you to have so what what really makes this surface book unique is that it is in most respects just like a physical laptop. And the screen yeah, detaches. Is it is it's that a laptop one? with a detachable screen? That's, that's what something you, that's that what, definitely Okay. Uh, the one other helps. negative about this, and this did not go away, Mary Jo Foley talks about it all the time, is because of the way this works, the keyboard, the bottom part, which on a normal laptop would be the heaviest, the center of gravity, is not it's very light compared to the top part. So Mary Jo Foley complain and a lot of do that it's the so wobble, easy to wobble, push this yeah. over there's a wobble too there's a sense of i think that might be why because I the center of gravity is up here not sure in the in <laughs> sorry to make <laughs> well that's appropriate actually the microsoft's cracking your iphone yeah <laughs> uh, so so there are in other words there are compromises in order to do that but if that's what rocks your boat floats your boat the detachable screen or anything with a detachable screen is going to be similar to that yeah and like i say i am a developer and when i go to a developer conference i do see a number of surface books you know people carrying a surface book so obviously it's going to have enough power to run visual studio oh and yeah do the, the work that i need to do i you know i really like this the new surface pro uh but do you not like the the that type keyboard that it comes with i I just really didn't care for the the new keyboard. I can no. completely understand that. I would say go for it. Uh, just from my experience, having had this for a year and watching Microsoft bit by bit fix the issues, those are fixed. Those bugs are gone. The people who don't like it, like Brad, Sams, and Paul, just have a problem with this kind of strange detachable keyboard and the and the you know the kind of the compromises you have to make in order to make this be a standalone computer attached to a keyboard I don't if that doesn't bother you this is absolutely reliable robust powerful and at a thousand bucks I think that's a pretty good deal I don't think you're missing a lot by having it be Sky Lake instead of is it Coffee Lake in the new one I don't know what the are these um, the, it's hard to keep up with all the I lakes know, the lakes it's a lake here a lake here uh, I think Sky Lake's fine I don't think there's yeah, any, all, all things gonna, being equal. I would love the newer model. It's just it's, it's a lot it's, of money. It's really pricey. They're overpriced, I have, in my opinion, especially given the, the the landscape. You can get a great Lenovo for half that, a great Dell for half that. 
Um, this is a great, I thought this was very nice. I was really impressed by the Yoga 920, but it's not detachable, and that's what you want. Oh, it's not? No. Oh. So that, no. that's the issue, and I think really there, there are others that are detachable. I think Microsoft's is the best detachable. So go for it. I'm going to give him the seal of approval. <laughs> okay, I'm going to tell him to continue to look into his heart. <laughs> Does it spark joy? <laughs> Does it spark joy? That's what we need to know. <laughs> And, well, and, uh, uh, when I make a final decision and make a purchase, I'll be sure to let you know. Yes, yeah, I we'll think the, I think the refurb is actually a good idea. That's going to be a pretty because there are a lot of people who return them, and that's going to work well. The bugs are ironed out. I guarantee you, they've really solved those problems. And one of the reasons, you know, this is something I've talked about before. People form an opinion of a product when it first comes out and the first reviews come out. And unfortunately, for products like this, this is Microsoft's first laptop. Uh, products like the Pixel 2 XL, uh, the first reviews, the essential phone, are the ones that stick. Even if the product problems were solved, as they were with all three of those devices mm -hmm. later, people still have that impression, ah, yeah, it's not a good device. I'm, I'm here to say it's a good device. Well, the other problem is, like, everybody has a different use case. Like, yes, I've been using it, but I don't use Visual Studio, so I can't really tell you how you like it. But you're smart to ask someone who's been yeah. using it for a long time rather than just to, you know, like we said, read the latest review right. of the journalist that used it for two weeks to write the story. Right. Yeah, Brad sent it back after a few weeks, I'm sure, yeah. I liked it. I used it for a year. I'm very happy. They fixed all the problems. I gave it to Megan because I didn't want it anymore. I'm going to start learning how to be a programmer <laughs> and I'll tell you how. No, it's great. Well, it's actually you, really you nice. Also, you also need to review more current products. So yeah, having, but you having passed it on after a year really isn't an uh, issue. No, I stuck mm -hmm. with it for a year. I mean, this was my Windows laptop for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, replaced it with the Lenovo Yoga, second generation, the X1 Yoga, which I really like. Um, uh, but I, th and, uh, you know, I, I really thought this was a very nice laptop. Great trackpad. I think you'll like the keyboard. It's, uh, it, despite the short travel, it feels pretty good. Uh, and it is a superb high resolution screen. I re actually really like the three by two aspect ratio. You're already familiar with that because uh, you're it's using a surface. Yeah, and Windows Hello works well. This does not have a <laughs> fingerprint reader. Yeah, look at uh, that. It just other, opened. Some other laptops do. My Lenovo does, and I kind of prefer the fingerprint reader to the uh, Windows Hello, but if you're used to that, that doesn't bother you. I can't see any reason not to get this. Let me put it that way. You're going to benefit if the price is so low because of all those people who said, no, I heard about all those problems. I don't want them. Right, which is exactly why I wanted to, to get yeah. Megan's yeah. thoughts on the, the current state of affairs. It Good, works right? great. Doesn't doesn't you have you had any crashes any issues? No, I've had no, no crashes, no, no. issues um, when I was checking yeah. the internet yeah. or reading my email. I think it's actually <laughs> or remarkable. watching Netflix. Here's a company, Microsoft, that's been around for so long, making operating systems, making software. Finally, for the first time, entering this the, the, the computer market, making actual computers. And of course, the first generations had issues, as would any company making their first products in that space. This was their very first laptop, and I think they did a very good job. They, it was unique. Remember Panos Panay getting all excited about mm -hmm. it and showing it how it detached? I remember that. And, and we were disappointed because it didn't work right for a while, but it does now. It really, really does now. There's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's good. Okay. Well, that's good to know. I, I appreciate your input. <laughs> okay. I'm glad you asked. That's what we need to do. We need to circle back. But circle back with yeah. the essential phone, circle back with the Pixel 2 XL with the Surface Book. Uh, because sometimes things change over time. Circle back. We should make a whole show called Circle, circle Back. Circle back. <laughs> Old stuff reviewed again. <laughs> <laughs> well, there has to be a podcast you listen to when you want to go to sleep. I think that's important. <laughs> Thank you, Lou. Bye, Lou. Thank you, Leo. Thank Great you, Great to have you. Thank Take you. care. We love those tech questions. Now, we won't be here for a couple of weeks. Next week, it's our holiday gift guide. We took all the gift guides. We've done how many total? 20? 1,000. 10? It felt like we did 100. 10,000. <laughs> We're taking them all. We're making a whole episode. So this is the last minute. It's the day before Christmas Eve. Last minute shopping. That's next week on the new screensavers. The week after, which is New Year's Eve Eve, we're going to do our best of uh, all the great moments, because it's been a fun year. Lots of fun moments, some with you, some with me, some with strange people you've never <laughs> seen before. And that will be the night before New Year's Eve. But January 6th, we'll be back, and we will be here ready to answer your questions. Here's how you get your question on that show. <laughs>
Need tech help? The New Screensavers are here with answers. Email your tech questions to newscreensavers at twit.tv. Did I say holiday gift guide? Yes, there's one thing we haven't covered yet. That's the best cameras of 2017. Who better to do that? The DP Review. Watch. Hi, I'm Dale Baskin from dpreview.com. The holidays are a time when a lot of people start thinking about cameras. In fact, it's a great time to buy a camera as a gift for a loved one. Or, let's be honest, probably for yourself. Whatever the case, we thought we'd share some of our favorite cameras to help you get started this holiday season. Let's start small. If you're looking for a pocketable point-and-shoot camera that you can take anywhere, there are a lot to choose from. One of our favorites is the Sony RX100 Mark V. If you're looking for a small camera that has all the features and performance you'd expect from a larger camera, this is the one. In addition to having an outstanding 20 megapixel sensor, the RX105 includes an excellent lens and produces beautiful 4K video. And despite its small size, it includes a pop-up viewfinder. It's no surprise so many pros carry this around in their pockets. If you're looking for something more affordable, check out the Canon G9X Mark II. This small, slim camera easily slips in your pocket, so you're likely to have it with you all the time. It doesn't have as many of the fancy bells and whistles you'll find on the Sony, but it uses a similar 20 megapixel sensor, has a very intuitive touchscreen interface, and delivers photos with the beautiful colors we're used to seeing from Canon. If you're a parent, student, or hobby photographer and want a camera with interchangeable lenses but don't necessarily want to invest in an expensive pro-level body, there are some great options for you as well. One camera we really like is the Olympus OM-D EM10 Mark III. Since it's built around the Micro Four Thirds system, it's very compact, and although it's only 16 megapixels, it delivers great images and video. One of its standout features is the built-in image stabilization system, which is so good it can make you believe your camera is mounted on a steady cam. If you want a camera with a full-frame sensor, consider the Nikon D750. Despite being a couple years old, this is still one of our favorite cameras. Its 24 megapixel sensor provides enough resolution to print just about anything smaller than a billboard. It also has a great autofocus system that can recognize faces and track subjects through its optical viewfinder. The D750 is probably one of the best ways we can recommend to get into a full frame system. Okay, pros, if you're looking for a top-end workhorse camera, there's great news. 2017 saw the release of several pro-oriented cameras, so it's a good time to move up from your previous camera. Two that we really like are the Sony a7R 3 and the Nikon D850. The a7R 3 is Sony's follow-up to its very impressive a7R 2 and its 42 megapixel sensor delivers enough detail for any application from landscapes to portraits. Landscape photographers will appreciate the camera's outstanding dynamic range, while portrait photographers will love its ability to quickly nail focus on a subject's eye. Since the a7R 3 is a mirrorless camera, it's possible to adapt most third-party lenses to work on it with a simple adapter. The Nikon D850 is a tour-de force of camera design, boasting a 46 megapixel sensor and most of the tools any photographer might ever need. It shares the same autofocus system as Nikon's flagship D5, a camera costing twice as much, and its low native ISO value of 64 gives it class-leading dynamic range that rivals larger medium format cameras. Basically, the D850 is a camera that can meet the needs of just about any photographer. Okay, we've been talking about fancy digital cameras, but what if you're the type of person who wants to be different? Well, we've got a suggestion for you too. Instant prints. Despite living in a digital age, instant prints are making a big comeback. Some of that's probably nostalgia, but there's something special about being able to take a photo of someone, then share the experience of watching it develop right in front of your eyes. We recommend using cameras based on the Fuji Instax system. There are a lot of them around, ranging from simple point and shoots to twin lens reflex models. People will love it when you show up at a party and start sharing instant photos. Finally, what if money is no object? If that's the case, check out the Leica M10. The M10 is a digital rangefinder stripped back to the essentials. This isn't a camera you buy because it has the best specs. Those who use them know there's a certain magic to shooting with a Leica rangefinder. It's a different experience than shooting a camera with full auto everything. 
a bit more contemplative perhaps, and to some degree a bit of an art in itself. But yeah, like most Leicas, it's going to cost you. If you're looking to get a camera this holiday season, we have a lot more information, including camera buying guides and product reviews on our website. Make sure to pay us a visit for the most in-depth information about cameras available online at dpreview.com. It's like throwing heroin in front of me. It's terrible. I've got a perfectly good camera right here. You know, oh. it's funny. So I'm going on a vacation mm -hmm. while we're on our uh, downtime, and I thought, whoa, I just got seasick. But that's because I'm going on a sailboat uh, next week with my son. And I thought, should I bring a camera? What yeah. should I bring? Or should I just have my... Uh, Camera phone? I, I can't decide. I don't know. Do you have a waterproof case for your camera? No. Like, don't drop it off the boat. Can't, isn't that waterproof? The iPhone 10? Well, I mean, I guess the case wouldn't matter anyway, because if you drop it off the boat, <laughs> You're never going to see it again. <laughs> no. Never again. All right. Are you ready for some uh, mail time? I'm ready for the mail. All bag. right. Why do we call the mailbag when it's a mailbox? No one knows. Do I ask? Does everyone ask that? Yep. No. He asked that. No. Why? I don't know why. It's time for it's the mailbox. <laughs> it's time for the mailbox. <laughs> this was a mail, actual mailbox that I bought for our house. Oh. But then I found out it doesn't fit on the pole I have. Oh. So I just brought it to Jerry and I said, can you turn this into a mailbag? And he did. said, yes. There's nothing in here except mail. Oh. Pick your, pick your uh, question. Doesn't matter which one, pick one, any one. There you go. <laughs> All right, mailbox away. It is time for question one. I've got that one. It's a two-parter. This comes from Aaron. Hi there. Hi. Says Aaron. My wife uses iTunes to back up her iPad. iTunes backup iPad. Okay, this is for you. And wants to know if there's a way to exclude apps like Overcast and others. She has almost. <laughs> 10 gigs of podcasts and video, maybe tell your, what? <laughs> and videos downloaded for traveling, but doesn't want this content to take up space on her computer when she backs up. So it's not just overcast, it's like Netflix downloads and that sort of thing? Yeah, I do the same thing. I, when, once I found out I could download movies from Netflix, boy, that's awesome. Put that on your iPad when you get on the airplane. You don't have to watch the airplane movie. It's really great. And when you back up your iPad on your computer, it doesn't put those Netflix movies on your... It doesn't? Does it? I don't I know. I don't know. I mean, it probably wouldn't because then... No, I can, get, I can guarantee you it doesn't. You know how I know? Because it doesn't put my music on the backup. It doesn't put my books, my audio books in the backup. So I bet you it doesn't put the Netflix movies. It, it, they're, they're reasonable. And what ends up happening is, in fact, I think they keep the backup small by not even putting the apps in there. Because yeah. when you restore a backup, don't you have to restore all the apps by downloading them and down, re-download your music and re-download your movies? I think you do. This is one of those things about um, Apple that is very confusing. And I well, don't understand why. Because it's, I tried uh, to figure it out. It's like app, app information is backed up. Is right. that Does that mean... Data is yeah. sometimes I mean, backed up. And also, if you're talking about Overcast or Pocket Casts or... I bet it doesn't know, back up well, Podcasts. You, you, when you have those apps and you sign into them, if you have an account it'll keep that synced in the cloud. So that's already in the cloud. You but don't you re-download the Yeah, podcast so she doesn't somewhere. want to re-download right. it is the problem, right. um, I guess. I don't know the answer to this question, and I really tried because and I don't think there's really a difference between backing up to iCloud or backing up to your computer in terms of what it puts on your, like, what I, it no, will back so. up. Yeah. Because there's no, it's not like you can go through and say, like, I would like to back up the Overcast app and right. the Netflix app, but not, you know, this. This is very Apple where they do what they think most people will expect, mm -hmm. but they're not explicit about what they're doing, and they don't give you options, because that would be too complicated. People would read it and go, what, is it backing up? I don't know. So they just, they just do it, and they trust that 90% will just go, yeah, you did what I thought you would do. Right. And the rest, like us, are just baffled. Yeah. I have no idea. On our holiday iOS Today episode, which we already recorded, but which you have not seen yet, we could spend an inordinate amount of time figuring out where our messages go when we but That was another up. one. Does it yeah. back up the messages? Yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, I've as since that show, tried restoring messages from a variety of systems, and almost always I start from zero. It doesn't, even though we know that Apple saves your messages on iCloud, 
when you set up a new machine or restore a machine, it doesn't, those messages start from zero from the day you restore, which is weird. But that's, I think Apple just says, but that's the right option. We don't, don't worry. Don't worry your little head about it, is Apple's attitude. So when it's backing up, we don't think that it's actually putting all so. of the overcast I'm, I'm on almost Netflix. certain, because I know it doesn't back up music. It doesn't back up books. It can't back up podcasts or movies. It can't. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is his second part. I'm stuck with a problem after switching phones. How do I transfer all my content? Oh, boy. <laughs> Messages, app, data, the whole thing from my old Galaxy S7 Android phone to my new LG G6 Android phone. Thanks a ton. So, uh, there's a couple of ways to back up an Android phone. The default way is to use Google's services to back it up. And that will not back up content. It will not back up apps. It'll just back up the list of apps you own. And just like Apple, you'll download the apps again. You'll ba download the content again. You'll have, to, you'll have to download all that. But it will restore your phone in the sense that it will have your pa if you If you save it, it will have your passwords, your network settings, and all the list of all the apps that you have installed and it will if you say yeah go ahead it will reinstall all those apps but there are other com other backup systems there's uh helium which is a backup system that you can back up like take an image of your phone if you do that it backs up everything so that's the difference in the android world at least there are third-party utilities and apps you can download. Here's Helium. This comes from the great folks who do Clockwork Mod. Uh, Koch really knows what he's doing. It's a very good product, and it does not require root to do it. So uh, that's, a good, I think, a very good choice. You can just back up everything that way, and you don't have to re-download it. There's, those are your choices. Uh, so, yeah, back up from your old phone to your computer, then get the new phone, restore in both cases using Helium, okay? Or just like what I do, see, I, I'm always setting up new phones, right? Every, every few months there's a new phone for me. So I just use what Google does by default, and, uh, and I just, you know, it takes maybe a few more hours. I'm downloading everything fresh, and I think that's probably, you're going to get the latest version of the apps, things like that. Well, the, the thing I used to be afraid of, the big things were my contacts and my photos, and those are all just in the cloud. Yeah, that's the thing nowadays, especially with Google, but true of the iPhone too, you're syncing to the cloud, mm -hmm. so you don't have to worry about it, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Yep. All yep. right. Email two. Yes, sir. When you charge the Apple Watch and lay it on its side, it turns into nightstand mode. Yes. It would be cool if the iPhone had a similar feature. Oh. Is there an app that does something like nightstand mode for iPhone? So I'll show you for those people who don't have Apple Watches. What I do this. Mode is. I have that little rubber Here's Mac, little and I put the thing in it. You ready, and it turns Alex? it into a clock. So. It goes from being a watch to whoop, clock. No, wait a minute. Hold on. Patience. It's charging. Any minute now. It did it before. It did. Just be patient. Okay, hold oh, on. No, beep, no, no. Beep, don't, you don't have to do beep, that. Beep. No, don't do that. You don't have to do that. That wouldn't make any sense because it's not on your wrist. Did it do it? Yeah, don't, don't, you're so impatient. I'm so impatient. Just wait. Maybe the power... Is not. It has to think for a moment. Is it plugged in? It's plugged in. It takes a second. It works perfectly every time. It just works. <laughs> just wait. It doesn't take a second. It should just do it. <laughs> Broke it. Wait a minute. It's upside down. What? Put the stem up. You silly person. Upside down? Yes. There. Oh, really? Yes. It has to be. Oh. The stem has to be up, of course. Okay, there we go. There just you like go. I said, it works every time. <laughs> I had no idea. Like, are you sure it has to be that way? Because I do it every. No, I guess you're right. My stand goes. You wouldn't put the stem down. You wouldn't, because yeah. that would be weird. So that's the magic. And he wants that for the iPhone. And I thought about this a lot. I gave this a, I looked into my heart, as I want to do, about technology. Samsung does it. The Galaxy and, S8 does like, it. But this, I don't want to, this is like the same thing, right? I mean, yeah. it's the time. And all no. you have to do is now you tap to open. Yeah. And so if, if this is sitting no, but on he a wants stand it by sideways your... with a big green. <laughs> right, he wants it big. So there are apps that, oh, sorry, that you can, there are apps. There's a nightstand you, mode app. Let me find Yeah, it. what you're saying is that, well, it already has the time on it. What, what do you yeah, want? Yeah, and then you just tap to open. So there's, let's see if this one works. Remind me later. There's this one, which, where do you want me to look there? But wait a minute. Doesn't the iPhone screen go blank after a little bit? Does well, so, it? Does the I, so does the, I, the, the does. Apple Watch you're does, right. too. You it doesn't stay it. on no, all night. You don't want to do point. that. That's waste of power. Maybe you um, do. So here, there we go. Uh, you know, There's that. In the old, oh, that's pretty. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's, uh, I think we have a link to that in the... Yeah. That's copying the HTC nightstand widget. for iPad. For okay, so I'm not the only one that has thought of this, and neither is our friend who wrote to us. Does it, does it go into uh, horizontal? Does it go in the landscape? Yes, look at that. Oh, nice. That really does look like a clock Yeah, now. and for some yeah. reason it's telling me New York, the weather in New York, too, which and, I've always yeah, wanted. Yeah. Um, and Craig Federighi uh, got an email about this. He's the they, guy in charge of software now. Yeah, and he said they've thought about it, but the reason they don't do it is that not many people... It's not super popular for people to charge their phones in stands by the side of their bed. What? It's not super popular. It so wasn't Frank until Frank. they uh, made an Apple Watch yeah. nightstand mode either. He thinks people just lay their phones down like they're animals <laughs> on there. Do you have a stand? I absolutely have a stand. Do you have a stand? I, yeah. Right, so then you can tap it and look at the time. Well, that's not why I have a stand. I just like to have it standing up so it doesn't fall over. Right, otherwise it's laying, as Renee Ritchie said, it's like an animal. Like an animal. But, you know, that's what they expect for us to do with the... Um, you know the wireless charging pads just lay it down all apple only sent you know only and sells the pads i want to just go on record uh that i am the guy who said if you're going to get a wireless charger get one of the t you know the easel ones like the tilt view the one mm -hmm. i use because then it holds your phone up and it just it's, it doesn't fall off right so he, what his, this email, the but other part of this email was that he used to have like, I guess a Motorola Droid, when you put it in the um, stand, the car stand, it would automatically go into like car mode. Yours doesn't do that? No. Mine does. You have an Android phone. Your Android phone, yeah. The answer is get an Android phone. Yeah, and look, the Android phone's always on, right? So you, you don't have to tap it. It's always telling you the time and date. You could have other stuff on there if you want as well. If you play music, it'll tell you what song's playing right there. You need an Android But this song. one has the weather in New York. <laughs> <laughs> and a beautiful mountain scene. And the weather in New York is not 41 <clears throat> degrees, by the way, either. There's, that's n no way. That can't be That's true. the weather here. I don't know why Maybe it says Maybe that's the New demo York. mode. Yeah. Well, it is the, the regular time. Oh, I don't know. Um, yeah, there's also one... Co oh, there's nightstand and nightstand and alarm clock. There's a lot of yeah. them. Yeah. There's, yeah. There's there's a lot of them. Good questions. Very nice. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, thank you for your question, uh, Michael. And thank you for being here, Megan. Thank you for having me, a Leo. Lot of fun. We are not going to be back again next week. It'll be our gift guide. And then the week after, it'll be our best of. So we will see you here. Jason Snell will be our co-host on January 6th for the new Screensavers. I hope you all have a wonderful solstice however you celebrate if it's festivus or hanukkah uh kwanzaa or christmas or just if, taking some time off of work just hanging know, out yep F uh, solstice is the shortest day of the year that already happened i think did it no i think it's coming oh, up oh, it's december 22nd 21st. usually 21st or second oh. so uh that's what that's what happens it gets dark and we want to scare the spirits away so they let the sun come out and that's what we're going to do. However you like to do that, I hope you do a wonderful job. You know what's the best part? It's getting together with family, sharing meals, sharing gifts. And then there's a big party, and we say Happy New Year, and we'll be back after this. Have a great, happy, merry Christmas, a happy new year, and we'll see you next time on the new screensavers. Would you like me to read you a story? Yes, in that voice, please. <laughs> hey, Google. <laughs> Twas the night before Christmas and all through the house. <clears throat> uh, I don't know about you, but I'm done. Thanks I, for joining us. We'll see you next time on the new screensavers. Bye-bye. <laughs> yes. That was almost the longest quit. Happy Festivus. The rest of us. <laughs>